Um, for our next presentation, we're going to switch gears a little bit and really dive into some real innovation happening in medical research currently. Um, my background is genetics, and this still kind of boggles my mind that we're able to do this or getting there. Um, 3D bioprinting is making it possible to create live tissues um, in laboratory settings to, in order to help us recognize early successes, um, potential failures quicker, um, and then it goes back to the drug development time frame. So shortening that time frame, shortening that cost to potential treatments. Um, so with excitement that I introduce uh, Dr. Eric Michael David, who is the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President of Preclinical Development at Org, or sorry, Orgo, or Organovo. Sorry, I totally messed that up. All right, where is, is that Dr. Eric David? Organovo, oh my god, so sorry. Thank you. Thanks so much for, uh, for inviting me today. Um, I will take you through uh, a little bit about what we do and why we do it. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and then you know, I'll, I'll take some questions at the end. Um, my background is, um, uh, is a little convoluted in that um, a long time ago I was a lawyer uh, and went into medicine and had the good fortune of working in New York City where I mean, you, you see the full spectrum of medicine. Um, I saw, you know, I got a chance just, even just in medical school and residency, to see more rare diseases than most doctors e ever see in their careers. Um, I, you know, handled crazy traumas ranging from spending four days of my life as a medical first responder at Ground Zero on September 11th um, to, um, to just, oh, thank you. Um, to, uh, to, to, you know, auto accidents that, uh, that, that are undescribable. So um, I, one thing that I left was a, a, with was a passion for two things. One was figuring out how to combine my interest and passion for medicine with an interest and a passion for bringing things to market as fast as possible and bringing them to patients as fast as possible. Because medicine, and I, I adore clinical medicine, I, patient care, sitting there with patients and families is, is truly uh, one of the most, I mean, is one of the most wonderful things I've ever done. It, it's, it's um, and, and I grew up with a father who was a physician who, you know, I used to watch in the hospital um, when I'd go on rounds with him on weekends, which you could do back in those days. Um, and uh, and I'd, I'd watch my father as he would pull up a chair beside a patient's bed and sit there literally for an hour talking with the patient, with their family. Um, you know, when that is your model for what medicine should look like, you, you want so badly for medicine to work as a system. And there are so many ways in which, over the last few decades, it's become immensely complicated, right? Some would say broken. It's hard to agree with the fact that it's broken in many ways, but everything from you know, the amount of time that patients and doctors spend together to how we reimburse things and, um, and how long it takes uh, drugs to make it to patients um, are, are broken. And, um, um, and at the same time, this industry, biotechnology uh, and biomedical research is, is more innovative and more creative than it's ever been. And take it from someone who has been around it a long time in a lot, wearing a lot of different hats. Um, some of the things you guys have been hearing about that NCATS is doing, uh, we have a partnership with NCATS, so you know, I go over there and see some of the crazy things that they're doing. Um, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, um, you know, modified mRNAs, there, uh, there is just so much out there that's immensely creative that, that gives me hope. Um, and one of my passions is how do we get that to, to, to patients as, as fast as possible. So um, as part of that, I just made my slides go away. As part of that, oh, this is just, we're a publicly traded company, so I have to put this slide up and tell you that I cannot predict the future. So, <laughs> um, uh, As part of that, I. I I'd like to start off with a quote from Anna Wintour, who, um, for those of you who don't know, 
is the much discussed editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine and the woman who served as the inspiration for uh, The Devil Wears Prada. Um, but what she said was as true of fashion as it is of biotechnology, right? It's all about timing. Uh, if it's too soon, no one understands, and if it's too late, everyone's forgotten, right? People don't think of that being true in the sciences, but it is. Um, thankfully, things sometimes come back in science as the way they do in fashion, right? Who would have thought that bell bottoms would make a comeback, right? <laughs> Not me. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but you might have looked at the late 80s, early 90s and said, after some of the gene therapy failures, who would have thought that gene therapy would ever make a comeback, right? But now it's back with an entirely new set of tools in a, in a really wonderful and very promising way. Um, and so I just put these quotes up from some interviews that I did when I was with McKinsey um, that I thought were really telling of, um, you know, some very prominent people talking about, and, and what, the, what these people said about regenerative medicine and tissue engineering and stem cell technology um, is, it goes equally true for, for gene therapy. Um, just, you know, you have, you have top pharma executives saying, oh, I think it's about a decade away from doing anything worthwhile. Um, you have a, a dean of a top 10 academic medical center in the US saying, you know, I have to tell you that whenever I go somewhere and talk about the promise of stem cell technology, people still think I'm, I'm, I'm talking about using, using embryos, using embryonic stem cells, uh, not understanding that, that, you know, it's so much broader than that. Um, um, you know, people just not understanding the difference between tissue engineering, stem cells, regenerative medicine, all of these technologies. So um, I think we have a lot of education to do still to, to move an industry that's inherently very conservative and slow moving past its inherent bias towards small molecule therapies and conventional biologics. Um, but I, I think, we're, I think we're, we're making good progress because um, the truth is, look, we, we all hope there are lots of things that can be cured with conventional um, therapies. But the truth is some of these emerging therapies are, are, are simply, you're not gonna cure certain diseases without either changing the genetics um, or delivering tissue or healing tissue in, in ways that we just cannot do, right? So, um, um, but it is all about timing and it, it's all about developing the conversations and, and moving them as fast as we can. So Organovo is a company that we founded back in late 2007. Um, uh, it was technology that came out of the University of Missouri out of a biophysicist lab uh, named Gabor Forgax. And Gabor was studying mammalian development and he watched um, embryos uh, as, as they develop, chick embryos. And he, he, um, you know, he observed that, uh, you know, when our tissues come together, it's not that they're formed one cell at a time. It's that after a certain point in development, droplets of cells, 1,000 cells here, 10,000 cells here, merge and they coalesce and the cells self-assemble into the fine tissue structure. And so Gabor asked the question, is there something I could do to force that happen, that, to force that process to happen in an in vitro setting, in a dish, basically? And so he developed the bioprinter as a way of doing that. He said, okay, well, there's all this 3D printing technology. What if we specially modified a 3D printer to be very delicate and, and use droplets of cells and put them next to each other and find a way to give them the cues to self-assemble into uh, fine tissue structures. And so that's what we do at Organovo. Um, we, uh, and we do two things with, with those tissues. We, um, uh, the first thing we do is that we're working on right now with a, a host of different pharmaceutical companies and academic labs. Um, we give them in vitro tissues, tissues in a, dish, in a dish that are fully human, architecturally correct, 3D tissues that they can use to do early drug development on. And you know, the, the obvious thing here is, is to give them a much more clinically relevant and cl clinically predictive system to test on before they go to clinical trials. We like to say it's, it's about as close as you can get to testing on a human being before you actually give a human being the drug. It also enables us to really look at rare diseases um, where it's been very difficult to build animal models um, or in vitro tissue culture models. Uh, 
And, uh, and, and so it's an exciting new technology for drug development. But then the second part of what we do as a company is to say, okay, if we truly believe that we can take these tissues and um, you know, make replicas of human tissues, and they're not exact replicas, I'll tell you a, a little bit more in, in a bit. You know, we would never say, we would never argue that the liver tissue we make, the kidney tissue we make, is you know, an exact duplicate of, of the, the human tissues in our body. But they are you know, functional in, in ways that they do you know, 85, 90% of what you need them to do. Um, and so we say, okay, if we believe our tissues are, are that clinically relevant, what happens if we start to put them into bodies? You know, will they do, you know, will they augment or replace organ tissue function? Obviously the goal here is to be able to supply organs for, for transplant. Um, you know, the technology is, is not right now ready to create a whole liver, a whole kidney, a whole lung or heart. Um, but what we can do right now is to make pieces of tissue that are smaller, but still for certain diseases, um, you know, there's certain pediatric orphan diseases that we look at where um, we hope to be able to deliver enough, t enough tissue to be curative. There are others where, okay, we may not be able to, um, to make a whole liver or, or kidney, but can we give a patient enough tissue to bridge them a couple of more years before they need a transplant, right? Even that would be a huge step forward um, on our way to eventually, hopefully, being able to make full organs. So that's what I'll tell you a little about, uh, about today. Um, we, we have a, a facility that manufactures all these tissues uh, um, in, in a clean room, which for those of you who've never been in, you gown up fully and it's obviously all, all very sterile. Um, and uh, we do all of that in our, in our facility in San Diego. We, um, you know, we believe in, uh, to really do what we wanna do, and we feel this is an area where a lot of companies who have entered the space before have fallen down, to really do what we want to do, you have to, to a certain degree, control every aspect of production, right? We use, um, we can use any cell type as an input into our tissues. We can use iPS-derived stem cells. We can use, um, um, we can use cells from um, from organs that have have not gone to transplant, which which are called in the industry are called primary human cells. So they're just adult cells, um, and um, and. You know, but the quality of the cells that you put in to make these tissues is obviously a huge part of the equation, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And so you have to ensure the quality of your cell sources. So we, we developed um, a, a wholly owned subsidiary of Organovo called Samsara Sciences that, um, where is it? Um, but um, uh, I'm trying to see, where are you? Oh, there it is. Uh, Samsara Sciences that actually, works with the organ procurement organizations in the United States um, to uh, when, when organs in our area are not going for transplant for whatever reason, usually the reason actually, um, the most common reason for that organs don't go for transplants is, is often that there's not an available donor um, and recipient match in the same area. And the organs have a limited timeline. You have to do something with them within, usually within a matter of hours or they, they become unusable. And so when organs don't go for transplant, we, we can get those organs, we can digest the, the cells off of them um, and freeze the cells and use those cells to create new tissues. And so it's a, you know, a way of, of ethically sourcing very high quality cells to serve as inputs into our tissues. We then have a whole team in house that builds our bioprinters um, and designs and is constantly iterating on the printers. We have all of the, um, all the infrastructure in house to develop all the cell banks uh, to create the bio inks that we use to put on the printers. And then of course we have the people who actually design and, and make the tissues. So when we talk about bioprinting and tissue engineering, which I'm sure is something that you know, many of you have read quite a bit about, um, and, you, and you'll see in the literature, you know, it comes in a, a lot of different flavors. Um, uh, ours, and I see that some of the wording here got a little cut off, I apologize for that. But um, what we do fundamentally is, um, is printing without a scaffold. So our finished tissues, the way our tissues are different, is our tissues are composed of just the cells 
And whatever extracellular matrix, whatever scaffold, if you will, the cells themselves lay down. We don't use any decellularized human scaffold. We don't use any polymeric scaffolds. Um, because that's not the way biology works. Our bodies, in the course of human development, our bodies don't lay down a scaffold and then put cells on top of them. The cells come first, and the cells lay down the scaffold that they need. And that's the way we approach the problem. We want the cells to do all the work, um, because that's how you get stuff that you know, most closely resembles the tissues in our body. Um, and so that's, that's the process that we use. We start, as I said, we can start with pretty much any cell type. Um, we then use the cells and make them into bio inks, which are cells mixed with a certain amount of media and, and some other things. We load those inks onto the printers. Our printers can have you know, two heads up to four or more heads. You can print, and each of those heads can print in different ways. Sometimes you use more of a droplet deposition. Sometimes it's more of a cell paste. Uh, sometimes it's actually closer to inkjet um, printing. And what you get out on the other end are tissues. The tissues, um, we, we print with a certain amount of precision, but then we rely on some of the cells to self-assemble into finer structures. Um, we then mature the tissues depending on the tissue type, anywhere from 48 hours to a few days before the tissues are, are ready for use. Um, and when I say that our tissues more closely resemble tissues in the body, what do I mean by that? Well, one thing we do in all of our cells, because if you're going to start to build thicker tissues, um, you need some degree of, of vasculature. And what we cannot do right now, right? we cannot do what a whole organ does, where you have large arteries that come in and branch off into smaller arterioles, and those then branch off into capillary networks, right? We, that we, we can't do yet. Um, we can do both sides of that. We can make large vessels, and we can make very, very small capillary-like networks. The, the trick uh, for the whole industry right now is how do you figure out how to connect all of those? But the good news is we can make both of those. So we put endothelial cells, the cells that line our capillaries, we put those into all of our tissues, but we don't dictate where the endothelial cells go. Instead, we put them in as part of the ink, we deposit them in the right proportions, and they self-assemble into these fine structures. And what you see um, in, that, in the, the image on the far right, um, that's a, the one labeled muscle and the one labeled liver next to it, those are stained for, for endothelial cells. Those are microvascular networks that develop in our tissues. And that's what allows us to build thicker tissues than you traditionally see in the tissue engineering literature. Um, uh, you then, um, you know, we then also can build uh, defined uh, compartments, tissue compartments, because as, as you may know, many of the tissues in our, in our body are defined in what, what people call parenchymal and non-parenchymal compartments. So the parenchymal compartments are, contain mostly the cells that actually do the work. Like in the liver, there's a specific cell called the hepatocyte that does most of the work that you think of a liver doing. But then there are non-parenchymal compartments where there are other cell types surrounding and supporting those hepatocytes in the work that they do. So we can engineer things in those compartments. Similar thing in our airways, right? That, the slide you see in the middle under the words 3D tissues with defined laminar structure, that's human airway where you, you have barrier layers to keep certain things out and allow other things in uh, and facilitate transport. Um, so there, there are a variety of ways in which our tissues are much closer replicas of in vivo tissue. Now, do we make simplifications? Of course, we have to, right? Because this is not human development, right? We are, we are approximating it as best we can. Um, so to give you an example, when we make liver, um, which you'll find me using an example because it's the tissue that we have the most experience with to date. Um, when we make liver, you know, do we really take do you really need to take all, like, uh, my liver, your liver, if we took them out of our bodies and looked at them, they would have about 42 distinct cell types in that liver. Um, billions of cells, but, you know, f composed of 42 distinct cell types. Do you really need all 42 of those different cell types to get most of the functionality you want out of a liver? No, it turns out that if you have four or five of the right cell types that comprise you know, 90 plus percent of, of our liver, you can get the functionality. So we make simplifications 
in, you know, in the name of being able to just create these tissues and, and fabricate them um, and um, in, in a rapid way. I'll skip over this slide. This sort of just compares our technology to, to a, a bunch of other technologies. But in the interest of time um, and getting to questions, I'll, I'll skip over it. We work with a variety of academic partners and industry partners. I, that's very important to me that we as a company um, you know, not only continue to publish, but that we work with a lot of medical centers. So as I mentioned, we have a, actually a printer that we've placed at, at NCATS in the NIH. Um, uh, we have um, that same printer gets used by folks at the NEI, the National Eye Institutes. Um, we have printer placements at, at Yale, at uh, the Knight Cancer Center, Harvard, a variety of other places, um, because we know that we can't solve all the problems alone. And uh, so we, um, uh, we are always very interested in, in collaborating. Um, this is you know, one of the things that inspires us to do what we do which is just a, a, a fancy graph for showing what everyone in this room already knows, which is that no, this is US data, but look, no country on the planet comes close to meeting its solid organ transplant needs. Um, the demand for, for organs and the need for organs far, far outpaces the, the supply. Um, likewise, in drug discovery, this is data from the best data set available, which was a 1990 to 2010 data set, where you looked at all the drugs that were developed, and um, there were 126 drugs that failed in phase three. So failed is late in the process, and therefore at the greatest cost to the system um, that it could possibly fail. And another 40, or so 39 or 40 drugs that actually were withdrawn after they were already on the market. Um, and usually the withdrawals are, are for to toxicity or for efficacy, as you see. Um, so there is a dire, dire need for more effective in vitro models, which, as I mentioned, is the other part of, of what we do. Um, in terms of tissues that we work on, which is a question we get a lot, you know, we work, um, we've done the most work on liver and kidney. We've done a good deal of work in oncology, uh, some work in lung, uh, skin and bone, and vascular tissues. We can make any tissues. It's just, we're a small company. At this point, we're about just about 120 people. So we don't have the bandwidth or the resources to work on everything. Um, one thing we are excited about is you know, the, the use of the technology, not just to do the, the two things that I mentioned, but also as a delivery tool. Right? As, as many of you probably know from, from studying and, and hearing about different gene therapies, whether it's CRISPR-Cas9, whether it's mRNA-based therapies, um, even some of the viral vectors, Sometimes the real challenge that we have is getting those gene vectors um, into the cells that we want them to at, at the right tissue location, right? Sometimes just injecting it into the bloodstream and hoping that it gets where it's going, whether that's a gene or whether it's a stem cell, um, you, you don't have a lot of traction. The, 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 the vector doesn't get to the right place. The cell doesn't get to the right place. So one thing that we are very excited about is, look, we can make tissues, right? If you want to deliver a transformed gene or a specific stem cell to a tissue, we can, we can use those to transform cells or use those stem cells to create tissues and actually sew those tissues directly on. So there's a lot of mutual compatibility among all of these different technologies that you guys have, have been hearing about. I'm going to skim through some of these slides. Um, but I just wanted, I feel like when you say you can make human tissue, people actually want to see some pictures and some evidence. They don't just want you standing. Because Lord knows in this industry, there, there is often a lot of hype, right? There, there are people, there's a TED talk somewhere that you can see um, from uh, a, a well-known academician who, um, who had a bioprinter in the background as he was giving his TED talk and claimed that he was bioprinting a, a kidney on stage. He, he didn't mention that it was a rubber kidney. Um, and, uh, and his university was immensely embarrassed by that. Um, but there's a lot of hype in the space. And so we like to be very transparent with people about what the technology can do now, certainly what the promises of it over the next decade. But you know, we feel like we can be in, in clinical trials with smaller pieces of tissue within the next three to five years. Um, and we're already, as I mentioned, already working with a, a number of different companies and universities uh, giving them tissues for them to do drug development on. 
So this is an example of our liver tissue. Um, these are printed in 24 well plates, which are just special plates that people use to, for those of you who don't know, use to do uh, testing on. Um, and so they're, each chunk of tissue in these plates is, um, is on the order of you know, uh, a centimeter by a centimeter by about a millimeter thick. We can make bigger pieces of tissue. We can't, the, the thickness is really our limitation right now. So in the XY dimension, in terms of length and width, were, um, or, or, you know, um, in, in terms of you know, length and width, we're, we're not that limited. But in terms of thickness, we are limited. You know, it, it's hard to make tissues that are much thicker than a millimeter and a half thick. Um, that being said, there's a lot that, that we can do with these, these pieces of tissue. In terms of studying diseases and drugs, for something like liver even, you know, there are a host of things from um, uh, disease modeling to toxicology that you can do. We're most excited about some of the pediatric orphan diseases in liver, um, some of the diseases that are adult diseases that have gotten a lot of attention recently that are fibrotic diseases, whether NASH or other diseases that lead to uh, liver fibrosis. Um, uh, but the, the tissues, these are all examples from our, from our tissues. Um, and for those of you who don't spend a lot of time looking at liver uh, under a microscope, which is probably most of you, um, we, um, you know, these actually look an awful lot like liver. If, if you put them side by side with human liver, you could tell which one was a real human liver biopsy um, and which one was not. But you would also notice th the striking similarities. Um, and so what you see in some of these pictures, um, the one on your upper left, uh, shows the, the defined compartments, the, as I said before, the parenchymal and non-parenchymal compartments. Uh, what you see in that middle panel on the top is fluorescent staining for the, the sorts of um, tissue connections, tight junctions, that are really characteristic of tissues and need to be there for the tissues to do what they need to do. Um, uh, some of these other ones, the image on the far right on the top shows a, a particular type of supportive cell that's um, nuzzled up to some of the vascular networks in ways that just happen spontaneously in the tissue. Because when you put cells in three dimensions, they just start to behave much more like the cells in our bodies. One of the big problems we have in looking at cells outside of the body is when you have them just in a Petri dish, they know they're not in the body, and they don't behave like themselves. Liver cells in a Petri dish, after 48 hours, they no longer behave. You wouldn't know that they were liver cells, really. Um, they don't behave like liver cells anymore. We, we build them into our tissues, um, and you can take them out six weeks or more. There's nothing magical about six weeks. Um, we just haven't taken them out any further. Take them out six weeks or more, and they're just as functional outside of the body as they were the first week. Um, it's, it's sort of like the analogy that I give to people who, who aren't scientists is I say, look, if you took me and you put me in a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot room and kept me there for the rest of my life and you fed and watered me as I needed to be fed and watered, I, I could probably live a pretty long time in that room, but I would profoundly not behave like a normal human being. Um, the cells in our body are, are not that different. You put them in a foreign, confined environment, um, and, and they, they're like, where the hell am I? <laughs> um, I'll skip through some of this data, but it's, it's data that, um, that just shows um, in drug discovery, the way some of our partners like Roche found that they were able to predict toxicity in drugs that, that had been taken to market and missed in clinical trials, not, not just missed in preclinical, but missed in clinical trials and missed until that drug was on the market. We were able to predict it across multiple different dimensions when they gave us these compounds in a blinded fashion. This is just, these are some pretty pictures showing liver fibrosis and how we can get those modeled in our tissues in, in ways that people have been unable to do in a dish. Kidney, as I mentioned, is something we work on. Um, and so there are some pictures that show you the very fine structure of the kidney. That's all about absorption and having transporters on the cells in exactly the right places. And these are pictures that basically stain for those transporters and show that they are in the right places. There's work we do in skin. We're very excited about some of the fibrotic skin diseases, Crest syndrome and others, that we think we have a capacity to model in our system. These are some pictures from oncology where we're able to build um, you know, fundamentally, to study some of the rare tumors right now, what you really need 
is a tumor surrounded by normal tissue because it's the interaction between the tumor and the normal tissues where all, all that we need to know really takes place. We're able to create models like that. Um, vasculature, as I mentioned, so I'll spare you some of the details. Before I take questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with a very quick story. And you'll, you'll see in a moment how it's relevant. But does, does anybody know who this is? Hemingway. Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway. So go back with me, if you will. 1920s, like a rainy night in Paris, the back room of a bar. Ernest Hemingway is sitting around a table with Gertrude Stein, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce. And Gertrude Stein takes a $100 bill, a US $100 bill, slams it down on the table, and says, that is for the person who can write a novel in 10 words or fewer. Um, now, my wife, my, my wife is a writer. And so when she tells this story, she, she always just says, where did a bunch of writers get a $100 bill? <laughs> um, but Gertrude Stein, True, Gertrude Stein was independently wealthy. So she slams the bill on the table and says, that is for the person who can write, who can write a novel in 10 words or fewer. Notice I didn't say 10 words or less, because that's not proper grammar. Um, and so everybody laughs. And you know James Joyce looks longingly in, in the corner. And Ernest Hemingway picks up a pen, grabs a napkin, scribbles something on the napkin, slams the napkin down, takes the $100 bill and walks out of the bar. And so what did he write? For sale, baby shoes, never worn. It's brilliant. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has all of the subtlety and ambiguity of a great novel in six words. So why, why do I tell this story? First of all, I just really like the story. <laughs> I think it's inspiring. I, I think. Um, I think there's something to it to me that says, if this guy, pardon my language, if this guy can, can, can write a fucking novel in six <laughs> words, surely we can do some amazing things with, with the tools that we have. Um, but, but, I, but, but I tell it for another reason as well, which is, look, you know, as I said before, to do the work, some of the work that we want to do, to replace organ function, do you, do you really need that organ to have every attribute of the organ you're looking for? Do we really need a liver that looks just like a liver and has all the cell types of a liver? Or do we need something that's an approximation, that's you know, a six-word version of a liver, um, but has most of the functionality relevant? You know, that, too, has some value. Um, there is something to this industry of needing to stop looking for the perfect solution and to start looking for you know, the solution that's a temporizing measure on the way to the perfect solution. Um, uh, so that's, um, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, and I'll pause there and see if people have questions. Have I, have I stumped everyone? <laughs> Okay. Hi. 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 That was a most fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, how do you get the tissue where it needs to go? Did I understand correctly? It needs to be sewn on. Right. So in in uh, in in preclinical studies in animal models that we work on, um, yeah, we sew it directly onto the organ. So in, in patients, that would be done most likely through a laparoscopic procedure. So we would hope to not have to do, because as I said, these are not full organs. They are smaller pieces of tissue. So we'd hope to be able to do it laparoscopically. Um, it's possible it might have to be done through an open procedure. But you know, in, in the vast majority of cases, these are patients who would be transplanted anyways. Um, there may also be, you know, there are some diseases where um, the location of the of the tissue may not be paramount, right? Where you may be able to put a piece of liver tissue somewhere much more accessible, you know, whether subcutaneously or in the peritoneal space, not having to do a bigger operation to directly access the liver. Good morning, and, and thank you for that very interesting presentation. Uh, we saw a lot about a 
about many types of tissue, but notably absent were uh, neurological tissues. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your company's plans or what the, uh, what the space looks like going forward, uh, obviously not for transplant, but for uh, preclinical and tox testing? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and you're right, th this is something we've struggled with. Um, we can absolutely use you know, CNS or peripheral nervous cells in, in our systems. We just, um, the reason we have, have not done as much there is first of all, the expertise in our company is a lot more around solid organs, not as much around uh, neural cells. The second reason is, it, it's a little bit more of a pragmatic one, um, and it's just that this technology that I describe is, is new enough, and of all the tissues in our body to make, you know, CNS is the most complicated. It's the, and it, it yields, itself the least to in vitro kinds of endpoints. And so we wanted to start with tissues that were hard, but that, um, but that were ones where we could learn something about the technology. I, I anticipate for us, I can't speak for other types of technology, for us, we, you know, we are looking at collaborations with um, academic labs that both are, you know, are, are, are CNS labs that work on some aspect of, of neural system diseases. Um, and, uh, and have that expertise to bring to the table and also have a real interest in what we're doing. We see that as, as the way forward because they will be able to answer the questions better than us. Hey, what are some of the quick wins where we can show that this, is, this technology really has relevance for, for CNS? Great presentation. I have a question regarding the types of cells that are implanted. Mm -hmm. And have you looked if uh, you implanted tissues like muscle with satellite cells with potential for regeneration or progenitors of the liver once you imprint the tissue? And how long does the tissue last post-transplantation when you put it in the in preclinical models? So great, all good questions. Um, yeah, we, we certainly look, I mean, in most of the tissue we make, there are always supporting cell types. In terms of implanting you know, cells that are closer to some sort of progenitor, um, it, it is something that we look at. Um, and we, we have done some studies there. Um, and, and because we're a public company, I can't necessarily speak to that data. But one of the questions we ask is, um, and, and we still have not yet a, a full answer for, is is it the right thing to actually put in progenitor cells or is it the right thing to put in <clears throat> mature adult cells and see if over time the progenitor cells in the patient's native tissue can be stimulated? Um, and so we, we look at both sides of that. Um, in terms of how long the tissues last, um, you know, what I can tell you um, publicly is just, you know, they, they, they certainly, you know, they certainly engraft well and, and do well for weeks, for weeks at a time. Hi. Hi, I'm here. Right there. I can't, on, I can't see on you. Your oh, there you are. Okay. Hi. You mentioned that um, the, one of the caveats is that the layer cannot be greater than 1.5 millimeters, correct? Uh -huh. So how about like creating about 10 layers, which would be about 1.5 centimeters, and combine them together to increase the thickness of the tissue? Is that possible? It, it, it is possible. Um, the, the, the key thing is, um, if you sandwich, if you take a bunch of, you know, if you take 10 tissues that are each a millimeter and a half thick and you stack them together, the problem is still how do you get nutrients to those tissues that are in the middle? Um, and, um, and so that's the problem we still haven't solved. You know, for the time being, we, we try to compensate for it by making, you know, longer and wider tissues. Um, but um, the, the problem remains, how do you get nutrients to those, those cells that are sandwiched in between? Hi, doctor. My name is Lucy Wong, and there was someone that wanted to find me because I had scleroderma. There was a pharmaceutical, they could find me. But the question I wanted to ask was, you touched on how cells can be injected in someone's buttocks, or I am. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm curious. You just touched a little bit. Oh, you mean when I was answering a question just now? No, during your lecture, how cells can be intravenous into somebody. Ah, oh, I see. 
But can you talk more about Because I'd like to know. You just touched it a little bit. Sure. Th yeah, thank what, you. What I was using, yes, of course. Um, I was using that as, um, as sort of an example um, to say, uh, you know, there are some modes of cell therapy or gene therapy where you inject the cells into the body and you hope that they find the right targets within the body. Um, and, and look, there are, I, I fully believe that there are some diseases where that form of therapy, whether you're injecting a cell-based therapy or a gene vector, I, I certainly believe that there are diseases that are gonna be cured that way. I also believe that there are diseases where you can inject all you want and the, the, the vectors or the cells are not gonna set up shop in the spot that you want them to and need them to. You know, they're gonna be cleared by the immune system before they get there or they're gonna, you know, they're, they're just not gonna otherwise make it where they're going. Um, and so I was, I was saying, you know, sometimes delivering a, a finished tissue may be a more effective way than some of these other modalities. Sure. Uh, we only have about four minutes left, so this might be one of the last questions, but I'll try to get to more. Hi, so I was wondering, with the 3D printing of organs, I heard like one of the biggest benefits was that you could use patients' own cells so they wouldn't have to take anti-rejection drugs, but the way you were describing it, you're still using other people's cells. So for these kind of like piggyback um, tissues, when you put it like with the old liver cell without doing a transplant, would they then have to do anti-rejection drugs? And how far are we from getting, being able to uh, use patients' own cells? It's a, it's a great question. So really what it comes down to, and we can certainly use it at patient's own cells, what it comes down to is a little bit of a, a regulatory challenge and a delivery challenge. And um, when you talk to, to regulators, whether it's the FDA or regulators in Japan or Europe, um, and when you talk to, you know, the, again, part of the unfortunate thing is also just, you know, the, the way that one has to generate enough supply of a drug, right? The, the, um, the concern with using a patient's own cells is, okay, to do that, we have to first meet the patient. We have to take cells from them. We then have to, you know, grow out those cells, bank them, um, make a tissue, and then go back to that patient and deliver it. And so it's, for the way the FDA or other regulators look at that is to say, oh my gosh, there's no standardized manufacturing lot. Uh, what do we do with that? Every patient is their own manufacturing lot. And so when we talk, when we think about trying to get to market as fast as we can, um, we think about, okay, it's gonna be an easier path forward to go with allogeneic cells um, and use those in the, fir the first time we go into patients. Prove out the technology, because it's a brand new technology, and then go and look at not only a patient's own cells, but perhaps accomplishing the same result using combining our technology with some of the CRISPR-Cas9 or other cell modification technology where you can maybe knock out MHC and just create a universal tissue that's not going to be. Now, you, what you don't solve with that is the fact that DNA is still immunogenic. Um, but I think, I think there's hope that you could come up with a nearly universal tissue and have a more modest form of immunosuppression. Um, but that, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of taking smaller steps at a time just in the effort of pragmatism. I realize, you know, I know to patients and families that's somewhat of a disappointing answer. Um, but I, I just believe it's the more prudent approach to actually move these into the clinic faster. Thank you for the question, though. Thank you.